Chapter 14, The Prospectors When Jack awoke the next morning, he threw off his blanket and rushed outside to see if their burrow was still there. It was, tied to a stake outside the tent. Good morning, Stubb, Jack smiled. Stubb was a veteran of the gold diggings. He gave Jack a haughty look. Stubb's a proud animal, the man had said when they bought him. Sometimes he thinks he's a mule. The burro's head seemed as large as his hindquarters, and his dark ears stood up like the wings of a hawk. Jack liked him. We're going to be friends, he said. Yes, sir. He untied the burro and threw a leg over his back. Stubb kicked out his hind legs. His tail flew, and Jack hit the dirt. The burro turned his thick neck and peered at Jack with disdain. Jack was so surprised, he just sat there. That wasn't very friendly, said Jack. Pitch Pine Billy, standing in the opening of his dusty tent, roared out laughing. You heard what the man said, Jamoka Jack. He said that mountain canary thinks he's a mule. Jack brushed himself off. All I wanted was to ride him. Pitch Pine Billy pulled a red bandana out of his pocket and came over. The mules in these hills is half wild. He tied the handkerchief around Stubbs' eyes. They don't take kindly to be in pack animals. You blindfold them first, and they'll stand still. Praiseworthy came out of the tent and stretched and sat on a stump to watch. Daylight was filtering through the trees, and the morning had a fresh, piney smell. Jack walked around the burrow, sizing him up. Then he spit in his hands, threw a leg over Stubbs' back, and held on. Ready, said Pitch Pine Billy. Ready, said Jack. Pitch Pine Billy pulled off the bandana. Jack braced himself. Stubbs stood for a moment, as if trying to make up his mind whether to act like a mule or a burro. Good boy, Stubb, Jack said tentatively. The burro flagged his ears and seemed satisfied that he had been shown the proper respect. He gave a little kick just to get it out of his system and behaved himself. Jack walked him up and back until breakfast was ready and slipped to the ground. We got ourselves a good burro, he called to Praiseworthy. Stubb gave, Stubb gave a kick, as if in protest. Mule, I mean, Jack corrected himself. After breakfast, they struck the tent, blindfolded Stubb, and cinched the wooden pack saddle to his back. They loaded up their grub and supplies, slipped their pick and shovel through the pack ropes, and were ready to leave. Jimmy from town came over with Buffalo John, both still wearing their neckties from the night before. Pitch Pine Billy gazed out over the diggings. Hangtown just won't be the same with a lady in it. Goodbye, gents, Praiseworthy said. I have a good mind to leave with you, scowled Pitch Pine Billy. The other miners came over, and it took five minutes to get their goodbye said. We'll be looking for you back come the middle of next month, said Buffalo John. You and the mountain ox. I'll be here, Praiseworthy said, taking the blindfold off Stubbs' face. Let's get going, partner. Praiseworthy picked up their new squirrel gun, and Jack took Stubbs' rope. The squirrel gun wasn't what Jack had in mind like a four-shooter, but it would do. They'd be able to hunt a little game, and he supposed it would stand off an outlaw or two if they met up with any. In jack boots and red shirts, they began walking upstream, and soon the farewell shouts of their friends were lost in the trees. It was a fine morning to be going prospecting, but Jack found it hard to walk away from Pitch Pine Billy and Jimmy from town, and even Buffalo John. Still, Coming back would be even harder. Maybe the mountain ox isn't as big and terrible as they say he is, Jack murmured. Worse, no doubt, said Praiseworthy. He sounded positively lighthearted. Are you really going to come back and fight him? I gave my word, didn't I? Bare knuckle? Absolutely. Praiseworthy was not pleased that he had won his name and reputation because he had swung on a road agent with a weighted glove. Jack kept a grip on Stubb's rope, and the animal followed with a clanging of drinking cups, coffee pot, gold pans, and empty tin cans. Jack had a sudden vision of his partner lying in the dust of the street, beaten and humiliated. Most of the miners are betting on the mountain ox, he muttered. 
Praiseworthy scratched through his whiskers. I know that, but I intend to beat him. With reading and writing? Exactly. Praiseworthy pushed the slouch hat back on his head. Miss Arabella once asked me to destroy a book she found in your grandfather's library. If I remember correctly, it was called The Gentleman's Book of Boxing or The Fine Art of Fisticuffs Explained and Illustrated. She was afraid it might fall into your hands, I suppose. I don't mind telling you that I didn't destroy it. I read it. I devoured it. Fascinating. I believe I could recite whole pages to you. Now it stands to reason that the mountain ox has never read a book in his life. He's no doubt a mere brawler. Therefore, since I have outread him, I see no reason why I cannot outwit him and outbox him. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm beginning to look forward to it. The two partners exchanged a glance and a smile and continued on their way. Jack put the mountain ox out of his mind. Do you want to carry our gun? said Praiseworthy. I'd like to carry our gun, said Jack. He took it in the crook of his arm, and while Praiseworthy led the the burrow and kept an eye out for rabbits, squirrels, savages, and outlaws, all they had to do now was find pay dirt. Chapter 15. The Man Who Couldn't Sit Down They pitched camp and they broke camp. Day after day, they followed running water. They washed out prospects scraped from behind rocks and boulders in the stream bed. Spangles had a way of trapping themselves out of the current. When they found bits of color, they dug in. At times, Praiseworthy spent the entire day with his boots apart, swinging the pick in great arcs. Where the prospects looked good, they labored to follow the specks of gold to their source, which either ended which either disappeared or ended at someone's claim. Where the fleas were bad at night, they stuck a lit candle in the floor of the tent, and in the morning, Jack would count the visitors to see whose gold pan had trapped the most. He kept track. I'm ahead by 82 dead varmints, he announced at the end of their first week of prospecting. And I've got the live varmint bites to prove it, Praiseworthy answered, scratching his back. The days were long and hot. Yellow poppies had burst open on the hillsides like scatterings of fool's gold. Sometimes Jack would catch Praiseworthy gazing out over some distant view as if it didn't matter if they ever got back to Boston. Smell that air, partner, Praiseworthy would say as if mountain air had just been discovered. Pay dirt eluded them. But the next bend in the river might make their fortune. They met other prospectors every day, and at times there seemed to be more pack mules and burrows in the hills than jackrabbits. After supper one night, Praiseworthy and Jack sat around their coffee fire, and a miner came along on muleback. Have a cup, said Praiseworthy, smoking one of the long nine cigars he had taken a fancy to. Can't stop, said the miner, as if he had a mouthful of gravel. A bandana was tied around his face, and one cheek was swelled out. Got a powerful toothache. Much obliged, anyhow. Where are you headed? Over to Shirt Shirttail Camp. I hear they got a tooth extractor up there. Jack pricked up his ears. Praiseworthy lowered his eyebrows. Would his name be Higgins? Doc Higgins, that's him. The miner gave his mule a small kick with his heels and was gone. Jack shook his head. I hope I don't get a toothache. No, sir. The imposter, Praiseworthy snapped. So that's where he ran off to. Cut eye Higgins, dentist of Shirt Tail Camp. No doubt he extracts teeth and gold pouches at the same time. The days passed in sweat and hard labor. The two partners kept on the move, looking for a claim to stake. They passed from ravine to ravine. The findings were slim. Still, Praiseworthy sang as he swung the pick, and Jack whistled a great deal. They got used to the sight of digger Indians. The women in bright calico dresses would come to the edge of the stream to pan in tightly woven flat baskets. The gold fever had passed no one by. Oh, it ain't gold fever the diggers has got, a prospector told him. The yellow stuff don't mean a thing to them. It's calico fever them ladies has got. And the men, they got serape fever and red sash fever. That's what they trade their dust for. Poor devils. They do like to dress up, don't they? Like a bunch of young ones. 
Stubb caused them no trouble as long as they treated him with the respect due a mule. Slowly, praiseworthy and Jack added dust to their gold pouches, but they were as far as ever from striking it rich. Here and there could be seen mounts of dirt and coyote holes where other miners had tried their luck. They passed through abandoned camps where Chinese had moved in to sift through the diggings left behind by others. They always seemed to be finding color that had escaped the pans and long toms and rockers that had come before them. Jack had seen rockers made out of anything from prov provision boxes to hollowed out logs. When finished, they had the look of cradles. He shoveled dirt into a hopper at the top, added water, and then rocked the spangles through to riffles in the bottom. Men could be found on almost every claim rocking the cradle, like grizzled nursemaids. Jack was fond of carrying the squirrel gun. They had been shooting what small game they could, especially after their bacon gave out. One afternoon, late in July, after they had made camp, it seemed to Jack that he couldn't face another plate of beans. He picked up the squirrel gun. I'm going to hunt us a jackrabbit for dinner, he declared. I can't imagine anything that would taste better, said Praiseworthy, chewing on a piece of oat straw. I'll be back. I'll expect you. Jack wandered off with the gun in the crook of his arms. He could feel new muscles along his shoulders and his legs had a spring to them. If Aunt Arabella and his sisters could see him now, he thought, they'd faint away one, two, three. He stopped to take aim at a mountain cat he imagined crouched on the limb of a tree. Bam! He'd skin it and make himself a hat. The sun was setting and the sky turned red. He raised a pair of gray doves, but he didn't have the heart to shoot them. They flew off, making a sound as if their wings squeaked. High in the trees, carpentaros were hammering away at their beaks. Not woodpeckers, he imagined himself explaining to Constance and Sarah. We call them carpentaros in the diggings. Praiseworthy took advantage of Jack's absence to try a little shadow boxing. He turned the pages of the book over in his mind. Elbows in, left jab. Faint, duck, sir, duck. Now the right. Put your shoulder to it, sir. The sky began to darken and Jack was unable to flush a rabbit. Instead, he flushed a grizzly bear. The great furry beast came crashing out of the shadows. He stopped, seeing Jack for the first time. Jack stood instantly petrified. He felt as if his boots were suddenly nailed to the ground. Twenty yards away stood a grizzly, and all he had was a squirrel gun. The animal rose on its hind legs and showed his teeth in a warning snarl. Jack tried to remember the things Mountain Jim had told, once told him about trapping grizzlies, but he didn't have a trap. He just had the squirrel gun, and the brute would brush off squirrel shot like so many flies. The grizzly opened his mouth wider, dropping some half-chewed acorns and roared. I'm done for, Jack thought. Done for. He got to his feet to move. He began to back up. Light was fading quickly. The grizzly dropped to all fours and came rolling forward. Then he stopped, for Jack suddenly disappeared from the face of the earth. He had fallen down a coyote hole, squirrel gun and all. Jack went up on his hind legs again and peered everywhere. He snarled. He roared. Jack waited twenty feet down, afraid the grizzly would fall in on him. Then the sound of the carpentaros burying acorns caught the beast's attention. He went crashing away to go climb a tree. Jack was scraped and bruised, but had broken no bones. It was only after he tried to climb out of the hole that he realized he might be late for supper. He couldn't get out. The sheer earthen walls gave way at every hand and foothold. Once he got himself halfway to the top, only to tumble to the bottom with a small avalanche of loose dirt. He began to call out, even though camp was too far away for Praiseworthy to hear him. He shouted anyway and waited, and shouted again. Finally, he took aim at the dusty sky and fired. The explosion boomed like a cannon and earth rained in on him. When the dust cleared, a face appeared overhead. Help, sir, Jack said. What are you doing down there? 
Trying to get out, sir. I heard you calling. You almost shut my hat off. Sorry, sir. I'll throw you a rope. After a moment, the rope tumbled in on Jack. He took a firm grip, hung into the squirrel gun, onto the squirrel gun, and the stranger pulled him out. Jack planted his feet on solid ground and heaved a sigh of relief. He was dirt from head to toe. I'm obliged, sir, he said. Why, you're just a kid, the man said, coiling the rope and hanging it on the saddle of his horse. And then Jack took a look at the stranger. He was a big man with worn boots and a white coat, a white linen coat, cut I Higgins coat. Jack backed away, almost stepping into the coyote hole again. What's the matter, boy? You look like you've seen old Scratch himself. Jack's heart was pounding. I know who you are. You're a road agent. Now that's a fact, the man laughed. But I've retired from the road agent profession. That's a fact, too. The boys was all shot, hung, or lost their ears. I got away with a load of buckshot in the seat of my pants. Why, I ain't been able to sit down in a month. Me and my horse, we both walk and hunt grizzlies. I'm reformed, that's a fact. You ain't seen a big fella around here, have you? I've been on his track for two days. Jack got a grip on himself, but he kept his distance. I'll bet you're still hunting, you're still out hunting for Dr. Buckby's mine. Mine? What mine is that, boy? Jack blinked. Didn't he know? Hadn't he ripped open the lining of Cut Eye Higgins' coat? Jack found himself leveling the squirrel gun. You pointing that thing at me? The reformed road agent laughed. Yes, sir. Now, that's no way to treat your benefactor, is it? You stole that coat you're wearing, didn't you? I reckon I did. Belong to a friend of yours? Why, it gives me a bad conscience to wear this coat, although I was awful fond of it. I'd appreciate it if you'd give it back. Always too tight on me anyway. He peeled off the linen coat and threw it toward Jack. Jack let it lie on the ground, even though he could hardly wait to get his hands on it. The map must still be sewn up in the lining. The man took the halter of his horse. Now, if you'll just let me walk away without shooting, he smiled, I'll be obliged. Sure you ain't seen a big grizzly around? With the price they're paying for bear steaks, he's almost worth his weight in gold. He just left, said Jack. Then I'll be going. The ex-highwayman started away and then turned with a final laugh. Boy, the next time you point that squirrel gun at me, a bad hombre... <laughs> Boy, the next time you point that squirrel gun at a bad hombre like me, you really ought to trouble yourself to reload it first. Good luck, boy. Jack's face reddened under the layers of dust. He watched the man disappear through the trees. He was sorry he hadn't been more polite to his benefactor. Thank you, sir, he called. Praiseworthy was just getting up to look for his partner when Jack burst into camp. Look what I've got! Praiseworthy peered at the white bundle Jack had made of the coat. If that's a rabbit, I'll eat beans. It's cut I Higgins' coat. Jack quickly told of the of meeting up with the grizzly, falling into a coyote hole, and then being pulled out by the reformed road agent. Just as quickly, Praiseworthy unclasped his knife and ripped open the lining. They laid open every inch of the coat. They examined and re-examined it, and Jack's ex excitement died away. There was no map. There had never been a map sewn in the lining of the coat. The scoundrel deceived us, Praiseworthy muttered. He never lost the map to those highwaymen. It has no doubt taken him to Shirt Tail Camp, and he may not have located the mine even yet. Otherwise, he wouldn't bother to pull teeth. Put some beans on to fry, partner Jack. First thing in the morning, we'll start for Shirt Tail Camp. <laughs>